Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Good Trouble Equity Talks podcast, and I am your host, Dennis Carpenter, and we are back. It seems like such a long time since we've been here, but guess what? Lots have happened. We have lots to talk about. Um, Haven't been here. Haven't been present. Been in the middle of a cross-country move. We'll talk about that briefly, but at the end of the day, I am (laughs) home. Kiara, I love KC. I love all my good people. <laughs> I am home. But can't do the first show without my home girl, Kiana Sinks. Give it up for Kiana. What's up? What it do? Thanks for having me on the Good Trouble of Equity podcast. This is dope. Oh, man. Like, we're so glad to have you. You bring such unique insight from a young person's perspective. And we're definitely going to get into that tonight. But we start. We begin by paying homage to our namesake, the person who a long time ago, I decided to name my podcast, my show after. And that is my fraternity brother. That is a legend. That is the conscience of the United States Congress. That is a man who risked it all so that all of us might have some level of opportunity as black folks in the United States. That's my brother in Phi Beta Sigma, a man who I've admired since I was a child, Brother John Lewis. Mm -hmm. And we all know that over the course of the last couple of weeks, we lost Brother Lewis. And man, when you talk about his intuition and his foresight to really leave with us his words of wisdom, even as he laid on his deathbed. I feel it's only right to start this podcast by literally reading, by literally (laughs) reading his last words. So I want you all to be patient with me. Some of you may have already read it. It was an editorial that he penned for the New York Times on his deathbed. And it's only right that we read it. And Kiana, Mm -hmm. you and I begin the show by unpacking that. And then we'll go into the other topics for the evening. Okay. The words of my brother, John Lewis. While my time here has now come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story. When you use your power to make a difference in our society, millions of people motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of division. Around the country and the world, you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. This is why I had to visit Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington. Though I was admitted to the hospital the following day, I just had to see and feel it for myself that after many years of solid witness, the truth the truth is still marching on. You see, Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Richard Brooks, my Sandra Bland, and my Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed and was only 15 years old, and I was only 15 years old at the time. I will never ever forget the moment when it became so clear that he could have easily been me. In those days, fear constrained us like an imaginary prison prison, and troubling troubling thoughts of potential brutality committed for no understandable reason were the bars. Though I was surrounded by two loving parents, plenty of brothers, sisters, and cousins, their love could not protect me from the unholy oppression waiting just outside that family circle. Unchecked, unrestrained violence and government-sanctioned terror had the power to turn a simple stroll to the store for some Skittles or an innocent morning jog down a lonesome country road into a nightmare. If we are to survive as one unified nation, we must discover what so readily takes root in our hearts that could rob Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina of her brightest and best. Shooting unwitting unwitting concert goers in Las Vegas and choked to death the hopes and dreams of a gifted violinist like Elijah McClain. Like so many young people today, I was searching for a way out. Or some might say a way in, 
And then I heard the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the radio. He was talking about the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. He said, we are all complicit when we tolerate injustice. He said, it is not enough to say that it will get better by and by. He said, each of us has a moral obligation to stand up, speak up and speak out. When you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state. It is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what is called the beloved community, a nation in a world society at peace with itself. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul wrenching existential struggle for a long time. People of every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change. And that is why the answers worked out long ago can help us find solutions to the challenge of the time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe because we put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Though I might not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it's your turn to let freedom ring. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest call of your heart and stand up for what you believe in. Now it's your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. If that's not a call to action, Tiana, <laughs> as we begin tonight's show, I really don't know what is. Mm -hmm. A man who gave it all, even until his final days. And in his final days, he acknowledged where we are right now in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And he talked about Emmett Till being his George Floyd, his mm -hmm. Sandra Bland, his Richard Brooks. He even talked about Elijah mm -hmm. playing the violin, the stray cats in the neighborhood. We got work to do, and this is why we're here. This is why we do what we do. We don't get paid for this. This is not something we're doing to put dollars in our pocket. This is something we're doing because our people and our community need it. Kiana, what's coming up for you right now? Welcome to the show. Yeah, man, thanks for having me again. And it's a quite a time to be alive. And there's a lot of things that, you know, when you read that from John Lewis and you take that in and to think that, the things that he experienced in his lifetime when he was literally changing the country, you know, and, and shedding his blood on the, on the, on the bridge, you know, in Selma, that's, it, it makes you just think about everything that we're literally experiencing, you know, when it comes to voter voting rights and how we're experiencing, you know, polls are, are, are decreasing and mail-in ballots and all these different things that 45 are talking about. So it just, just, it's very symbolic. And I think, we just have such a unique opportunity, not only as a community, but as a country to push forth and, and, and uphold what he left in that letter. And I think until we're able to reach a point where we look beyond ourselves and we really start looking at it from his perspective and, and, and taking that in, we'll, we'll, we'll never get it. I don't think we'll, we'll, never, we'll never understand. 
he talks about ordinary people being able to do extraordinary things. And there's no doubt in my mind that we're just ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And we can do extraordinary things. So when I think about everything that's going on in our country right now around the movement that we have to keep that synergy moving, when I think about to reopen or not to reopen, as many of my friends and longtime colleagues are starting to try to figure out what we do about school this fall, we're going to talk about that during the pivoting in the age of COVID part of our conversation. Kiana, what are your <laughs> thoughts? What are Man, your thoughts? I mean, just like everyone has already exposed, I just feel like at this point in time, if you're still questioning whether inequity is, is the real thing, I mean, like, wake up. Like, you've been on a rock for the past, like, six months. I mean, everywhere you look, education, you know, local politics and just in other states, voting, you know, a lot of things are at stake right now. And so just thinking about what we have right in front of us, you know, and, and, and when we talk about education, when we talk about our kids, you know, they're our future and we should invest. And some of us, are, quite frankly, are doing the, the complete opposite of that. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not putting our kids first and we're, we're literally risking their lives and, and putting them in schools where we have leadership, you know, in local, um, you know, local communities that are, are some are, are doing the best that they can. And, and some are just like, hey, like, I'm just going to ignore the science and, hey, you got to get in school. And so parents are now left to make hard decisions going into the fall, whether do they, you know, homeschool my kid and, you know, make the adjustments with work or do I just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm that single mom that got maybe four or five kids that I, I can't even be home with my kids, you know, like I, I got to go work because if I, if, I, if I stay here with them, then we're not going to be able to eat and have anywhere to, to live. And so I think I, I don't, I'm not a parent. I'm, I don't have any children, but I, I couldn't fathom thinking about what it, or it, what is going through parents' mind right now as they move closer and closer to until August. And so, you know, you mentioned before we came on the call, like, you know, like people know, like, you know, your kids, you know, when, when they're, where they're supposed to be academically. And I'm sure like every parent is seeing that right now who cares about, you know, academics and their kids that they're not where they should be. They're going to fall behind. Now right. it's just a matter of like, what do we do to make up that deficit? Cause clearly it's not going to come from a national level. You know, when we look at education and, and Bessie DeVos who does not have any experience <laughs> whatsoever, yeah. whatsoever. Um, so we can't depend on national politics right now or national leadership to, to be able to facilitate not only a, a COVID-19 plan for, for health concerns, but, education we're just saying hey kids gotta go to school just send your kids to school when we see like sports were closed sports we're right. still seeing positive cases they're increasing everywhere and we're going to dig deeper into that but i want to stick in this space right now of leadership you know mm -hmm. leadership you know you talk about a person who's led at all types of levels and early on and and the first in this place and the first in that place but Reverend Sharpton said something about John Lewis that sticks with me. I think I retweeted it that day and I posted it to my Facebook page. But he mm -hmm. said leadership is more than a title. And he said titles did not accent John Lewis. John Lewis accentuated the titles. Yeah. So the titles didn't make John Lewis. John Lewis made the titles look good. Mm -hmm. This is real leadership. So when I think about the lack of leadership around the pandemic, when I think about some of our African-American leaders and that we depend on and we trust to be there for us, getting embroiled in scandal. And, you know, my, my story <laughs> in terms of my show, Kiana, it goes from coast to coast. Yeah. Right now, I'd be willing to tell you that I have listeners in California just as well. Yeah. I, I have listeners in Georgia. I have listeners in KC and whether they be on Facebook, whether they be on YouTube or wherever. And I have listeners all the way down to Georgia. I have mm -hmm. listeners in Canada. So when I tell you this is a serious matter and we yeah. have to have this conversation about our leadership being on the line, I'm not here to condemn anybody. But all I'm going to say is this. If you're not serious about leadership and the role mm -hmm. that you hold right now in this moment, 
our black community does not have time to play games with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a serious matter. If you're not serious right now about your leadership, what I'm going to say to you right now is step down. If you're going to do something to distract from the movement or do something silly that's going to bring embarrassment to the movement, step down. No. I have led and I've been in that leadership space for over 20 years. And the only thing that I can say I had close to a scandal is some racist white folks trying to dig something up on me. And they found mm -hmm. a picture of me hanging out with my partners in which I was playing with them, flipping the bird and laughing at one of my partners. Yeah. In my 20 plus years in leadership, that's the closest thing I've ever had to a scandal. Mm -hmm. I ain't taking nothing from nobody. I'm not trying to get something for nothing. I'm not trying to use the system for my own benefit. And when we do that, all we're doing is distracting from the movement. So what I'm saying to all of my black leaders right now, the moment is too precious. Mm -hmm. The legacy runs too deep. We lost C.T. Vivian and John Lewis in the same day. And we're looking for leaders to come carry the torch. We ain't looking for the foolishness in the BS. If that's what you're about, man, shut it down. Shut it down because there are real people out there doing real work. And guess what? We're speaking at the polls now. I'm thinking about Kansas City. We had an election yesterday. So mm -hmm. many historic things happened in the state of Missouri yesterday. Yeah. Elisa Kennedy is the Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor. Give it up for my girl, Elisa Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And we got to stick behind her. We have to support her and hopefully place her into that lieutenant governor position. And when we do that, guess what, Kiana? She'll be the first black person in the history of Missouri to hold a state office. Be, be dope. That would be dope. And at the same time, it's a damn shame, right? Yeah. That in the history of Missouri, <laughs> we've never had a black person hold state office, elected office. So give it up yeah. for the candidate. Yeah, man. She, Mike she, Sharp she got a lot. To, yeah, we're going to speak on these people tonight. We're not holding back. So here it is. Mike Sharp <laughs> tried to rear his head again mm -hmm. to become Jackson County Sheriff. This man had some of the most salacious acts I've ever read about in a public office during his tenure as sheriff. I mean, you don't have to hear me talk about it. Google Mike Sharp, Jackson County Sheriff, and all kinds of sexual foolishness when he was in office. Yeah. And Sheriff Forte had to come behind him and clean that up. And just like all the time when a black man cleans something up, some white guy wants to come behind him and take the credit. Or when a black woman yeah. cleans something up, some white person wants to come behind them and take the credit. But the voters didn't allow that to happen in Casey yesterday because Sheriff Forte beat him going away. Give it up for Sheriff Forte. <laughs> Give it yeah. up for Sheriff Forte. Dope, dope. Yeah. Major things happening and we can make a difference at the polls. What was most promising to me about yesterday mm -hmm. is that African-Americans are seeing the value of election times that aren't the presidential election. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to talk about primaries and I'm not going to talk about midterms. No, go to the polls. I'm going to make it plain for my people. We have to go to the poll when there's something to vote for other than the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just make it plain. We're not going to get into caucuses. We're not going to get into primaries. We're not going to get <laughs> into any of that. We're going to get into if your poll is open. Yeah. Think about Hello. John Lewis's head being bust. You know how we talk to the white meat. Think about his head being bust to the white meat and get yourself to the poll. Our people mm -hmm. did that yesterday in the KC area. Give it up for mm -hmm. my folks in Jackson County, Kansas City. You made a difference even on the Missouri side. You know, some of our Black Lives Matter activists, man. Give it up for Bush, man. She got in there. Got yeah. in there. Black Lives Matter activists. Got in there. She beat an African-American incumbent, but I mean, that last name has held that seat for decades. Yeah. It's time for some fresh blood. Get in there. Get in there yeah. and do work, man. So we're super excited, super excited about that. This is the Good Trouble Equity Talk podcast. I am your host, Dr. Dennis Carpenter. I'm kicking it tonight with Kiana Sinks. We are here to talk about the legacy of John Lewis. 
what it means for us in terms of our reality right now. And then we're also going to talk about what it takes to pivot in this age of COVID. So here's the deal. <laughs> here's the deal, Kiana. What's the deal, Doc? You can tell I haven't been on in weeks because I'm in rare form. <laughs> I know. We will never go back, and I want everybody to hear this, all of our listeners. Mm -hmm. We will never go back to where we were before COVID. Even yeah. if, even if we find a vaccine for COVID and we eradicate it, the world will never be the same. What the world is going to be is the best it can be in terms of a new version of itself right now. Mm -hmm. What that means is we all have to change and adjust and modify. So Kiana, we call that word in the business space pivot. I'm mm -hmm. going to make pivot plain for my listeners tonight because we're talking about pivoting in the age of COVID. Let's make it plain. You're an athlete. I played a little bit myself. Give it up for my recreation coach, Robert Allen. <laughs> was his name. But the natural flow of movement in basketball is to dribble. That's mm -hmm. the natural flow of movement in basketball. But every now and then, a defender comes along. And that defender causes you to pick up your dribble. And you have to stop. Stop the natural flow. Yeah. But that does not mean you can't move again. And if you make the right move when your natural flow is stopped, you might be able to score a basket. You might be able to assist to someone else who might score a basket. But just on your natural flow of stop does not mean that it's over. So the natural flow is you're dribbling. But when you make that stop and you have to hold a ball, what do you do, Kiana? You got to pivot. <laughs> pivot. You use that pivot. And yeah. when you use that pivot, guess what? Somebody might be over the, under the basket. Guess what? You might pivot and get a shot off. Right might. now, the world is causing us to pivot. Let's start with yeah. your pivot. You're a grassroots organizer, boots on the ground, engaging community. Then COVID comes. You can't go meet and greet, hug babies face to face. You had to pivot. Talk to us about yeah. what you were doing before COVID and the pivots that you made, Kiana. Yeah, well, grad school was finishing up, you know, that first year was like, hey, you know, excited, got it all done and going into finals and then, you know, mayor, the mayor shut it down. And so not only are you trying to deal with, okay, what's happening and adjust, you're trying to figure out like, all right, how are we going to finish grad school online? Because half of my teachers don't even know what they're doing online. Um, so we got it done and made it out. And then to your point, social distancing, you can't meet the virus. We don't know at that point in time. We didn't even have social distancing measures really um, early March. It was just like, it's COVID, you know, and we, we on lockdown so we figure out something. And so um, moving forward, you know, can't, can't meet people, can't greet. And I had to pivot, you know, I launch up next my podcast. And for me, it's been, it's been super dope. You've been a guest. Many leaders across Kansas city um, have been guests on the show and it's allowed me to really listen. Um, as much as I ask questions, I really, have learned a lot and really have learned a lot about people that I thought I knew, but I really didn't, or maybe I did, but I learned something new about them. And so it still kept me um, kind of just out there and really still having conversations that I would have in, in, in real time. And so I think that's been the most critical part is how do you still engage and still have these critical dialogues, but yet you can't see people and you don't have that real time access. And so you just, you get online. Technology is amazing and thank God wow. for it. Yes. And yeah, we're able, even right now, we're able to have this conversation and you all the way in Georgia. <laughs> right. And, and so think about December 4th when we were at the gym theater, we got 250 or so people there. We had a kick butt show and we thought that this was December 4th, 2019. And yeah. we were planning the next one and the next one. Yeah. No one, no one could have told us on December 4th, 2019, that COVID would hit and change everything. Nah, we was rolling. We was like, yeah, we going we lined enough stuff. We we coasting. We had a huge event. The momentum, why equity, why now is what Dr. Carpenter is referring to. Um, the roundtable, uh, my business partner, Nicole, we hosted a conversation around equity and education. 
Um, and for those of you who don't know, Dr. Carpenter was, uh, as they would like to say, he, he, he moved on, but he was, he was pushed out, you know, just because of the very thing that's trendy right now is what you were, what you were advocating for, for our youth and for our kids. And so we wanted to bring that to the forefront here in Kansas City. And, and we did that and it was a huge success. It was much, it was much needed for Kansas City. And I'm glad that we did it looking back, but no, I mean, we was all up on each other. Everybody was close. And <laughs> it's like, yeah. now it's the complete opposite of that. Um, right. And that conversation, honestly, in that presentation is probably needed much now than it was then. You know, Absolutely. sad to say, wow. sad to say, I mean, you could, you could do that presentation again. Cause I think it time, it calls for, for a time such as this. Um, that's how proper it was. And people who were there, they said the same thing. Um, so wow. it was dope. It was dope. Yeah. So we did that and no one could have told us that we were going to be in this place now of, of pivot and pivoting in terms of our business. If you have a restaurant, and it was just strictly based on a packed house and dining in. If you're doing that now, folks are dying because of it. Think about your pivot. Think about another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Think about another way to do it. So any business area that you're in right now, it's time to start thinking about your pivot and how you're going to make a difference so that you can maintain success in this new normal. Because even when we get rid of COVID, Things are not going back to exactly the way they were. So be thinking about what you're doing, thinking about your pivot. Any other thoughts about pivoting, Kiana? No, I mean, I just think right now, I mean, Dr. Carpenter, you said it best. I mean, what was then and what was then and what's now was now. And I, and I say that very loosely, but and, and very cliche-ish. I mean, it's been hard for me. You know, it's been hard for everybody. You know, if, even if you got a, all the money in the world, as you know, you look up, you see LeBron on TV, he's like, this is my kids, this is my family, like, everybody, it might not be money, but it might be, okay, I need to, you know, seek counseling. It might not be counseling, but I need to figure out like, crap, my business is struggling and I, we need to, we need to change things around. So I just think what we, what we knew, we, we just, that's just no longer going to exist. And so we just have to put our energy and our focus in moving forward. And instead of just thinking, oh, you know, I want things to be the same. And honestly, it, it kind of offends me when I hear with around race relations, you know, I wish things were the same. So I think there's a lot of things that are being exposed. So for me, mm -hmm. I'm glad that we're actually dealing with it because I don't want to be 50 and 60 and we'd be <laughs> right back here, you know, right. um, in like another 30 years. And so I'd rather for us to at least try to address it um, with everything, you know, and, and try to, and try to do the right things that we need to do. And so, my encouragement would be to everybody, you know, to just really latch on to people who you care about and let's do this, you know, and, and get, seek that encouragement. Um, I think I read a quote, you got five minutes to cry and <laughs> five seconds to cry and then you got to boss up after that. So, boss up. Yeah. So, boss then, up. you know, you got to keep moving. So you mentioned race relations and man, you know, I stood with, you know, John Lewis and it, I'm sorry, George Floyd and his family and, did that work and still committed to that work and elevating some conversations. But Kiana, I'm getting a little nervous about what I'm seeing. You know, when the world responded to the death of George Floyd, it was on television every night. There was protesting in streets in every city across America. Major companies and corporations and organizations came forth with their equity message, their equity mm -hmm. statement. But a statement is only a statement unless you do the real work that's necessary to make that statement a reality. Mm -hmm. So we can have two conversations at one time, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Because yeah. we started the show being very, very clear about what we have to do as a people to make certain that we don't go backwards. You know, I said the other day that I'm about ready for folks who aren't wearing a mask who are coming within six feet of black and brown people to be charged with <laughs> attempted murder. And I'm laughing, Dr. Carpenter, I'm not laughing at you. It's just like, I mean, that's real. Like, if you don't wear a mask at this point, it's like, what are we doing? Like, you know, cases are increasing. You know, people are getting sick. It's time, we've seen Dr. Fauci talk about 
mm -hmm. know, what happens when we don't wear a mask? And what does that look like when someone sneezes or someone coughs? Or if you're talking to someone and you're in a hand, hand reach out, you know, proximity. So, yeah, I mean, I'm more impacted to be sick than my friend, my girlfriend, Brittany. I mean, that's just right. that's just what it is. So, and, and, and see, I'm home now, Kiana. So, you know, a lot of the names that I heard in Kansas City, I may have known relatives, but I did not know the person. Mm -hmm. But now when I come home and I see Mr. Holmes from Thompson Bridge, I know exactly who Mr. Holmes is. And I know yeah. what he meant to his family. When I hear Reverend Jerry Smith, I know Reverend Smith. I know what he means to the community. When I hear Miss Cal Anthony, I know what she meant to my neighborhood and some of my best friends and her son, one of my best friends, Corey Newkirk. So these are more than names to me. Mm -hmm. The numbers, the 150,000 deaths when you get home and you come back to the crib, mm -hmm. no, those numbers have faces. Yeah. Those numbers have real faces. So what I'm saying right now is if I walk into a store like I did today and this country bumpkin looking white guy is refusing to wear a mask and the store owner is not telling him to put on one. And then when I mention it to her, when I get ready to check out, she tells me something about the governor overriding the mask order, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All I'm saying is, is this man trying to murder me in a different way? Yeah. Because we know where the murder of black men started with beating and lynching. Then when that wasn't sexy anymore, then we started to do it economically and, and in other ways. And so now that we have the COVID data out there, mm -hmm. and this might not be too popular with some of my listeners and I get it. You're not mm -hmm. man wearing a mask can either kill me or kill somebody I love. Because yeah. I'm, I'm leaning on the side of science. And science tells me that when I wear the mask, I'm more so protecting people from me than I am protecting myself. That's what the science says. So when you walk around without a mask, you're not protecting me from you. Yeah. And you also know that we, Black folks, Latinx folks, are dying at a higher rate. So when I see your Trump bumper sticker, <laughs> no, no, this is real. When I see your Trump bumper sticker, I know. and when I see you with no mask, I have to raise the question, are you trying to kill me? Yeah. Or kill somebody I love? So November can't get here fast enough because maybe there will be greater leadership if we flip the federal government in a way that might allow us to be led out of this pandemic. Yeah, it's uh, and, it, it, he's unraveling. He's unraveling. And, and let me and, just keep it, let's just keep it real. My people, black folks, <laughs> this is not wearing a mask. <laughs> this is not wearing a mask. You don't know how many of my people I've seen in the last two weeks from Kansas City, driving down through Illinois, through Kentucky, North Georgia, down to Burke County. This is not wearing a mask. This is 100. Folks, wear a mask. <laughs> all of this. This is wearing a I'm mask. I'm sorry, but... I'm not trying to laugh. That's carpenter, but it's like it's it's legit. You're not even you're not really covering up anything when you just do. I mean, your mouth. you gotta wear a mask, and too many of our people aren't wearing a mask. Two. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I was in a store the other day, and we weren't we weren't wearing masks. You know, now a lot of some stores are making it mandatory before you walk in, but like smaller smaller you know businesses are not. Some are, some are not. It depends on where you're going. You know, if you're going in Price Chopper, they're making everybody wear masks. You can't even right. walk in. But some are just still not. Here they are. But when you're walking around, they're not wearing masks. The only reason why they're wearing the mask is because they know they can't get inside to get what they want. And as soon as they come out, it's just like they just take it off. But it's still yeah. people coming in yeah. and out and all that good stuff. So and, and, I don't know. And it, and in Georgia, I'm seeing something different. I mean, even in some of the major stores, folks are allowed 
to walk in with no mask. Mm -hmm. They are allowed to walk in and do their business with no mask. So if you don't wear a mask because you care about yourself, that should be the first yeah. person. Self-preservation and loving and caring for yourself. Yeah. But I don't know how we got but I don't know how we got to it being so political. Like it's it's a it's a mask. It's literally something that's going to protect you. And this is exposes more of when we don't have national implementation around health and policy, where we start seeing the deficits or the lack of when we don't have that guidance, you know, us being disconnected from the CDC. There are no scientists at these press briefings every single day. It is literally just the president just talking and just rambling and unraveling before the American people and our democracy and when it pertains to health and blacks and, and, and everybody, Latinx community and so forth, we are literally dying. And I was, I was listening to Don Lennon, he has a new podcast too, and he was talking about even how that impacts data from like a year from now, you know, some of it, you know, people are working hard or different public infrastructures attached to the CDC are trying very hard to keep up with everything, but that's hard to communicate and keep information that we need and that they need. Um, because the White House is not working with, you know, health healthcare um, or health policy makers to ensure that the American people have what, what they need at hand. So it's, it's all dysfunctional. So dysfunctional. dysfunctional. This is the Good Trouble Equity Talk. We are live tonight with Kiana Sinks. Kiana is the founder of Black Excellence KC. She's a host of the Roundtable KC and the podcast Up Next with Kiana Sinks, social and civic innovator and working on that MBA. Kiana, how's that going? I'm going to stay on you until you have that MBA. What's going on? <laughs> it's going good. You know, classes start on the 24th. So It'll be interesting because the professors are facing us in and they're facing us out. So there will be a rotated schedule on who gets to come to in-person class and who doesn't. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting, but, you know, it'll be different. I don't know how I'm going to do, um, you know, the whole learn thing online, but we'll figure it out because some things need to just be in person, in my opinion. Um, but it's going well. I think this will, you know, elevate me in, in a way that now that I need it. Uh, for me, I know that what I have in my shared lived experiences and what I've been able to accomplish is great. Um, but we know we are in a society where we have to do what all is necessary to reach our full in and out goals. And so I think, if anything, that is what that NBA is going to do for me um, personally. So, no, it's going good. And keep on me till you get that. Do you get that graduation invitation? <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. And that's, yeah. a, good, that's a good segue to the final topic of the night when you talk about the hybrid model that you're going back to school within you know some of you coming in and others coming in after and that mm -hmm. brings me to k-12 education you know that's that's my space that's a space that i've committed my mm -hmm. my life to and really want to talk about k-12 education and this is for our teachers this is for our parents this is for our leaders because i'm gonna frame this conversation and I'm also going to make a big announcement tonight. And this announcement is especially important to parents of our earliest learners. I'm thinking about first graders, second graders, third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders, and also teachers who teach our youngest learners. So stick mm -hmm. with me here. We saw pictures coming out of a high school in Georgia this week whereby this school system, I'm sure, thought they had some of the best laid plans. Mm -hmm. And Mike Tyson once said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that punch in the mouth for this system yesterday was the return of real lives to the school building, i.e. students. So I'm mm -hmm. sure they said they were going to mandate masks. I'm sure they said they were going to do all of these things at this high school. But pictures were taken around that high school that showed clearly the vast majority of the kids in the hallways, they were literally elbow and shoulder to shoulder and the vast majority had no mask. Mm -hmm. I have been a part of that system for the last 24 years. It's a system that made me the professional that I am today. Mm -hmm. But I'm just gonna offer to you 
as parents and a person who has the latitude to say this as a former superintendent and educational mm -hmm. leader, it's going to be very hard for the school district to maintain your children in a way that's socially distanced that will provide for their safety. Mm -hmm. Several other schools opened up in Georgia and the very next day we heard about COVID cases on the news this morning. In spite of maybe some of their best efforts, it's going to be a hard lift. It's going to almost be unattainable. Yeah. Here's something else I'm going to tell you. Your child left school in the traditional fashion, regardless of where you live in our country, sometime around mid-March is when school districts shut it down. Mm -hmm. When they shut it down in mid-March, that means that come September 8th, from the middle of March to the middle of April, to the middle of May, to the middle of June, to the middle of July, to the middle of August, to the middle of September, you're talking about six months. Yeah. Your child will have gone without direct instruction. Six months without direct instruction. I want you all to follow me tonight because this is the big announcement that I posted about that was coming on. And I wanna educate mm -hmm. you, I wanna give you some information because you don't have an asset as a parent that's a greater asset than your child. I don't care mm -hmm. what kind of car you drive. I don't care how big your bank account is. I don't care what kind of home you live in. You do not have an asset that mm -hmm. is bigger than your child. And when I tell you this, I tell you this from a place of pure love as an educator. And when you have your biggest asset, you have to protect it and invest in it to keep it. So my kids took a test this week. Hmm. My son's a gifted student. My daughter, very smart, very creative. Mm hmm neither one of them scored at the level that I predicted they would score and I believe they would have scored. And guess what? We read every day, but reading is not direct instruction in a place called school. Mm -hmm. They work on things that jar their mind and keep it moving, but that's not direct instruction from a caring, competent teacher in a place called school. Yeah. So despite or in spite of a school district's best efforts around virtual learning, if your child does not have the ability to access a teacher, they are going to experience some slide. Mm -hmm. That means that they're gonna regress. My children, as smart as they can be, they have regressed. I have the test result results to prove that they've regressed. But because they're my number one asset, we're going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Here's what's going on across the country right now, Kiana. And this is my big announcement for the night. It's something that I really, really want to do for our community. I want to share. It comes at a cost, but we're going to talk about it because it comes as a cost to me. But yeah. here's what's happening right now around the country. Wealthy families, primarily white families. You can mm -hmm. read about it, Google it, write this down if you're watching tonight. Education pods or pandemic pods. Google pandemic pods or education pods. And if you really, really want to be a gifted student, also put in the term inequity and the inequity that these pandemic pods are going to cause. So here's what's happening. The school is giving a parent a choice. Virtual hybrid, face-to-face. -face. Most smart parents who believe in science don't believe their school child needs to be in school face-to-face. -face. So they're right. choosing a hybrid or they're choosing full virtual. Mm -hmm. They also understand that their child is not going to get the same thing that they get face-to-face -face with a teacher in school. So these wealthy families, primarily white families, are creating what they're calling pandemic pods. They're getting with other like-minded parents in their community and they're saying, we're going to split the cost and hire a teacher. We're going yeah. to keep our kid enrolled in the school. He's still going to get the assignments from the school. He's going to do, he or she's going to do the virtual option, 
but we're going to have a teacher that's going to work with our four or five kids and make sure that they don't just get assignments from school, but that this teacher teaches them the assignments and make sure they understand what's expected of them for that year in that grade level because yeah. they have the resources to do so. And if you read mm -hmm. about it, some of these families are paying teachers as much as thirty to $60,000 to be their child's pandemic teacher. Look yeah. it up. You don't have to believe me. Look it up. Hmm. So you know what that's going to cause, right? Our most vulnerable students, our students from families that do not have the resources to fork over whatever mm -hmm. 60,000 is divided by four. I don't know. Maybe that's $15,000 each. I'm not doing my math right now. So if you don't yeah. have an extra 15 grand laying around in your, in your family, you probably can't participate in that part. Even if it's an extra five grand, let's say you go in with four families and you give a teacher $20,000. You don't have that laying around. Your child is going to get further behind in the gap between them and their white peers and their more affluent peers is going to widen and widen. Yeah. Am I saying that our parents need to invest that type of money? No, I'm not, because I know we don't have it. But somebody posted the other day on Facebook. They were soliciting. They said, I need someone to watch my child because I'm not going to send them to school and they're going to do virtual. But I have to go to work. That's real. I get it. Yeah. But I'm just going to submit to you that it's about more than watching your child. You need someone to help educate your child. I, forget you, I, with a doctor degree and a wife with a doctor degree, we have work to do during the day. We need someone to help educate our children. Mm -hmm. Because whatever school district they're in, in spite of their best efforts, it's not going to happen the way it happens in a classroom every day, standing before a high quality teacher. Yeah. So I have I have I have something in the works and, and I have it in the works and I believe the most vulnerable amongst us are our elementary students mm -hmm. because they're learning to read a little more than they're reading to learn. They're learning those foundational math skills that have to be built upon so that they can be scientists and doctors and engineers when they grow up. Yeah. And if we miss this during this pandemic, we're going to change the ability for them to be what it is that we know they could be in terms mm -hmm. of their life prospects into the future. We can't miss this opportunity. So I have a friend and a partner. His name is Jacob McIvire. He's out of Dallas, Texas. And I want you all to write it down. Google it. It's way 360 learning. S-W-Y-E 360 Learning. Mm -hmm. I'm going to purchase his platform and I'm going to bring that platform to the Augusta, Georgia, the Waynesboro, Georgia, the Bullock County, the Scriven County, the Jenkins County area. I'm going to bring that platform in order for the, and it's pricey. This is giving back in some ways and it's capitalistic in others. Because if you don't invest in your child, who will? Mm -hmm. We'll hire a trainer and they'll train yeah. our child for two days a week. What I'm getting ready to try to offer to our families is a personal concierge, i.e. a personal teacher for your child. Yeah. That can interact with your child virtually every single day for a minimum of two hours per day. And that teacher will only have no more than 10 other kids that he or she is interacting with. So I'm calling wow. on all of my teacher friends. All of my teacher friends, I want you to inbox me, preferably anyone who's certified to teach grades K through five. Anyone certified to teach grades K through five, I want to hear from you. I want to meet with you. You don't have to be in Georgia. You can be anywhere. You can be in Kansas City. You can be in California. You can be in North Carolina, South Carolina, Idaho. It does not matter. Yeah. 
but I want to meet with you. I want to talk to you about this opportunity. We've already ran the financials. We put together a financial model for this market that we believe is fair. That will also handle a secondary problem, which is low teacher pay. Because if a teacher has a caseload, I guarantee you that I can pay them more than anything that they get paid in a school around after school tutoring or before school tutoring or being a softball coach or being a volleyball coach. Under this model, I'm going to pay teachers a significant amount each month to make sure that our children know it's going to take a small investment from you. But the first thing I want to do is I want to hear from teachers. If you're interested in black, brown, and poor children or any child getting behind and the implications that that can have for that child in his or her life, I want to hear from you. Send me a message. All you have to do is say, Dennis, Carp, Dr. Carpenter, whatever you call me, I'm interested. If you're passionate about young children, I want to hear from you. From yeah. there, then we're going to be recruiting our families. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be enough saying I chose virtual. The school sending home assignments, their check-ins with the teacher. It does not substitute from direct instruction. So here's what we're going to do virtually. You're going to have your own teacher. You're going to have your own login to the platform as a parent and as a child. The platform is not what we're doing now, just video talking. That same interactive whiteboard that's in your child's classroom, we're going to have it in the virtual platform. Those same assessment and questions that teachers ask when they're teaching in the classroom, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to do it for your child virtually in the platform. And I have commercial space for anyone who might be local. If you're working with a child and you find out that that child needs some one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to have a facility that you can come yeah. to with that child and their parent and sit down with them and work with them socially distanced within that facility. Folks, we got to take care of our kids. And right now they're getting behind. And I'm not just talking about those children. I'm talking about my children are getting behind. So teachers, if you're interested in partnering with Aspirational Insights to do all we can to support our kids during this pandemic and being compensated in the process, I want to hear from you. Parents of any child, grades one through five, if you're concerned about the future prospects of your kid and their education, and you know that life will not allow you to be their teacher, in spite of what the system is doing, and you want to add to that, I want to hear from you as well. We're going to prove the concept with three to five teachers. I'm going to hire three to five of the best teachers I can find. Teachers, you can keep your job. If you're teaching virtually, you can do it in your free time during the day. When you wrap up your virtual instruction, if you are teaching full time in your building, you can do it in the afternoon. You can set the times that you work with these kids. Parents, be thinking about this. The only thing your child needs is a device. That device has to have a microphone and a camera. So any device, whether it be an iPad, whether it be any other Chromebook, whether it be a tablet, if your child has a device, this teacher will be able to connect with them. Parents, you can do the same thing I'm doing right now with your child's teacher at the click of a button. Mm -hmm. You're going to have day-to-day -day access to this teacher. Let's make it plain. Let's say the teacher sets up a meeting with your child at three o'clock tomorrow and you have a hair appointment. Your child can be at home on their device working with that teacher. You can be sitting under the dryer in the beauty salon on your phone watching that session with your child and that teacher. Real teaching, not just giving them assignments. No. Folks, this is real. Teachers, this we're not going back because these parents who are doing these pandemic pods, they're the same parents that know how to apply pressure to the system in a way that we are still learning as black folks. So when they see success with this, the system will never go back to what it was because they're going to impress upon the system. They're going to demand from the system to keep this type of learning going for their kids. It's going to be more convenient to them. 
They're going to control who these children interact with. And it will not go back to the way it was. And if we don't do something for our children, they're going to get behind and the gaps are going to widen and widen. And we already know that they are just awful already. Yeah. My partnership, I'm putting on the line financial resources to bring this to a community and to an area that raised me, that birthed me, that I know needs it. All I need is teachers to help me and partner with me. You will be compensated in a way that you'll never be compensated for before and after school tutoring. How do I know? I know all about stipends and supplements. I used to sign off on them. I helped develop them. Mm-hmm. I know I'll beat them all out and it won't even be close based on this model. Parents, your child is your greatest asset. You're going to have to invest in them in this new normal, in a way that you haven't before. I posed the question. I said, are you going to invest in your child with any kind of supplemental services? Just kind of testing the water. It was amazing how some people said, I'm waiting on the school district. No, whatever the school gives me an option. I know I'm not sending them to school. I'm going to do virtual. Your child Mm -hmm. can't learn what they need with the homework packet. Yeah. Your child can't learn what they need checking in with the teacher on video two, three, four times a week. I want to provide a personal teacher, a personal concierge. I've already talked with a few who are interested. Any teacher, anywhere. If you're concerned about this topic, this is going to be posted. It's going to be on my page. Any teacher, anywhere, I want to hear from you. Because I'm going to prove this concept with three to five of the brightest, best teachers I know. And from there, we'll grow and we'll grow and we'll grow, bringing children what they need, because I'm afraid of what's getting ready to happen to our young people. So much so that I'm willing to put resources that I could dedicate to my family and my kids on the line to try to make this happen for more kids. Yeah, that's amazing. And just to be blunt about it, Kiana, and and I'm going to keep it real. I got to meet with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation about the same project next week. So there could be something coming down the pipeline there. For those who don't know, I work on a couple of projects with the Gates Foundation now through the University of Kansas. I've talked to them about this because all the articles are coming out. You better read them. Pandemic pods. Wealthy, rich families are doing it and they still get to take advantage of the school being the teacher record. So that means, guess what? If there's a bright nursing student or a bright science student at a college near them, they can use them because it's not about certification in the teacher. It's about getting your child taught because their teacher is still at the school. If your child goes to school on an A-B schedule and I'm going to close here, some of them say, I'm going to choose the hybrid, the A-B. That means your child is going to be going to school in front of a teacher half the time that they used to. How can you expect their outcomes to be the same? If your child goes on Monday and not on Tuesday, goes on Wednesday, not on Thursday, and everybody goes on Friday, whatever your hybrid schedule is, your child is getting half the learning they used to get from a teacher. Yeah. And rich folks have figured this out already. And they're already working on it. And when they work on it, their children do this. When we don't work on it and wait on a broken system, our children do that. So what does the gap do? It gets wider and wider. They're saying the inequity in the new virtual environment can be two times worse than it was in traditional schools. So I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to need some input from you because, folks, your child needs a teacher. That was my announcement. That was the big thing I wanted to get out tonight. The first call to action, and there'll be more. We're going to be building some websites and building some pages. The first call to action is if you are a teacher or a person who believes yourself to be one who can effectively teach, and we'll help you, kids Mm -hmm. in grades one through five, I want to hear from you. Inbox me, call me, Dennis Carpenter, D Carpenter at aspirationalinsights.com. Just to be blunt, my cell phone number is 770-617-3200. It's just that important. 
It's just that important. Your child's your greatest asset. You got to invest in them. Kiana, thanks for being here. Thanks for helping me bring this home tonight. Anything you want to say before we check out of here? No, hopefully you put a flyer out or something about that. People need to connect with it and just follow up, you know, and it just, I learned a lot, you know, just education really with the kids besides hearing parents stressing and got to find nannies and the other stuff and babysitters. And I mean, man, like parenting right now is just super duper stressful <laughs> for, for everybody. So, I mean, it makes sense, you know, like our kids with the inequities that are already present, you know, they're just only going to be that much greater. Um, so we have to, to work twice as hard um, to make sure that they have what they need, but also, you know, our white counterparts again, like you said, are already putting together pandemic pods, um, mm -hmm. getting their, getting their, getting their ducks in a row um, before August at, of that, whatever that schedule school day is. So they're mm -hmm. going to be ready. They're going to make sure their kids have everything. Um, we're going to make sure, you know, you want to financially invest in something to make sure that we all are ready. So we just need to take advantage of it. Um, if you have a kid or if you're a teacher, what was that number again? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so hit them up. Yeah. So here's, here's the thing. And we're going to close right here. Sway 360 Learning, the company I'm partnering with. You, Jacob McIvine, one of the leading thought leaders in education technology. He was the CEO of Panda Learning when it started with game mechanics in the education environment, has been very successful for close to 20 years. He's a programmer. He's a builder. He's an ed tech person. He's a tech guru. He's a friend. So Sway360 is a black owned company, just like Aspirational Insights. Yeah. For us, by us, and through us. 100% <laughs> black owned companies. Because we got to deal with this notion that white is right. And that's something that we have to grapple with. So once again, we're going to be posting the information. Teachers, I need to hear from those who can teach like their hair is on fire. Children in grades one through five. Parents, take care of your greatest asset. Rest in power, John Lewis. Thank you all for watching. Kiana, thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure. Keep doing great. For you. Absolutely. We're over and we're out. Good trouble, necessary trouble. Peace.